how long is it going to take before the next experience happens, our brain and our awareness is immersed in those particular things. And when our brain is immersed in those particular things, even though the brain is processing 400 billion bits of information, we keep our awareness on only 2,000 of those 400 billion bits. And it has to do with the body, the environment, and time. These people who had spontaneous remissions, they move their awareness from those particular things to those other bits of information. And when they did that, we're beginning to learn from a scientific standpoint is that's the moment that the brain begins to pattern new circuits and new connections. So this began an interesting study for me because I wanted to know, based on these four things, what was happening in the brain to determine what was happening in these people's physical bodies. Could it be that they changed their mind, and by changing their mind, it had a physiological effect in their body? Now, some of these people weren't vegetarians. They didn't do crystals. They didn't fast. They didn't do any alternative therapies. All they did was they changed their mind. And by changing their mind, it produced some measurable results in their life. So I began this process of understanding how the brain makes new circuits and makes new connections. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the way science has progressed over the last couple hundred years, and I'm going to tie it into our understanding of the brain. Back in the 17th century, there was a man by the name of Descartes, and he was a French scientist. He was sitting by a fountain one day, and he was trying to understand the nature of reality. And while he was, as he was sitting by this fountain, he said, you know, I'm having difficulty merging two ideas See, there's an objective world. You know, there's an objective world he called the sphere of science, where things behave like a machine. He said the Earth and all of its laws and all of physical reality behave in a very physical mannerism. And those, those physical traits are very predictable and they're very repeatable. And he said, I'm going to call that the sphere of science. And anything that has to do with the objective or very large, science can study. And then he said, well, anything that has to do with the mind or our subjective world or subjective reality, I'm going to give to religion because religion has a better handle on it. And really what Descartes was saying is, I want the freedom to be able to study science without having to deal with those other issues. And so the church began to focus on all the principles of subjective world and, and mind. So the church became always mind, never matter, and science was always matter, never mind. And things worked really well because up until this point, you know, this, the church delving into science created some problems and science delving into the mind created some problems as well because uh, if we look at Bruno or we look at um, Galileo, we can see that when they made their particular observations, it defied the church and, of course, there were some speed bumps along the way. And it, was, it served Descartes very well because he didn't have to deal with issues other than things that were predictable because he was a scientist by nature. He didn't want to deal with influences by the church because if we study history, if we study Galileo Galilei, or we study Giordano Bruno or in earlier times, when they said that the earth was no longer the center of the universe, they were persecuted by the church because it went against the very doctrines that ran the church. So Descartes had his own freedom now to study the nature of reality. And things worked really well, and by observation, scientific laws began to develop. And in the 18th century, along came Sir Isaac Newton. And Newton basically said, there are certain definite laws that we can actually put a scientific value on. He knew that force and mass and acceleration are related. And Newton said, if I know the starting point of something, and I know its velocity or its speed, I can determine where it's going to end up. And because of Newton, we're able to put a rocket on the moon. 
if we know the distance from the Earth to the moon and the, the rotation of the Earth and how fast we're going to shoot that rocket, because of Newtonian laws and Newtonian physics, we're able to do some very specific things based on the very large and very objective laws. And things worked really well, and science continued to emerge. And then in the 19th century, Albert Einstein comes up with his theory of relativity and his theory of light. And Einstein basically said, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Anything as an object or mass that travels faster than the speed of light will ultimately become energy. And because of his laws in understanding relativity, he emerged even greater understandings about objective reality. When Einstein published his papers, the most amazing thing about Einstein was that there was no real footnotes to his information, which blew most of the scientists away in, uh, during his time. And he was a visionary, and he understood the way things worked because he applied his mind. And so Einstein, Einstein's theories uh, pushed science into a greater degree in, in its acceleration. And then after that, he, Einstein began to work with this principle called the photoelectric effect. And, and what he was doing is he was pr producing very strong electrical currents into steel plates, and he wanted to see the energy that was emitted uh, in terms of ele electrons and protons and, and uh, neutrons. And wh what he, when he started to study what the electrons were doing, instead of the electrons releasing energy in a very continuous and normal fashion, the electrons released energy and dropped the level, like it was moving down a staircase instead of moving very smooth and continuous. Now, Einstein stopped because the way things work in the very large is that when energy is released, things move in a very continuous fashion. For example, if we drop an apple from a tree, it moves in a very continuous and predictable fashion, and they expected, in the photoelectric effect, the very same things to happen. They didn't. And so Einstein began to see that the very tiny started to be, behave very different than the very large. And so there were a series of experiments that began to focus attention on electrons and where electrons would be. And when they began to observe electrons and the nature of electrons and how they behaved, they noticed that wherever they observed or looked for an electron, an electron appeared. So the electron went from a wave of probability to all of a sudden collapsing into a very definite particle. And now this whole idea of Cartesian dualism, what Descartes said back in the 17th century, started to get fuzzy again. Because now the subjective person and subjective mind was beginning to have a direct effect on the very objective. And so now the separation between mind and reality and mind and objectives began to merge again. And independent of who was doing the observation, whether they had an academic degree or they didn't have an academic degree, that their actual observation had an effect on the quantum field. And so quantum physics was born as a result of this. And now, that means now that all of us, every single person, independent of their creed or their culture or their gender or their age or their race, that every single person when they're asked to observe something, has an effect on the very tiny, that we're all participants in the nature of reality. Now, science may say, well, quantum physics and the observer observing reality and having an effect on reality only works for the very tiny. In other words, only the very tiny respond, uh, responds to our observation. And so maybe then, the way in which reality works is that if our observation makes a difference in the way that small subatomic particles function, maybe we can direct our, the nature of reality based on our own observation. Now, most quantum physicists will say no. Our observation only works for the very tiny and not the very large. And my answer is, maybe we're just poor observers. Maybe observation is a skill just like anything else. And we can develop this idea called observation.